This is Dennis Ramundi. I'm here with my co-host, Phil Goldberg, author of American Veda, our podcast, Spirit Matters, found at spiritmatterstalk.com. Our focus, contemporary spirituality, and our guest today, Mike Zappi Zappolin. Uh, Mike is an American entrepreneur who is considered one of the pioneers in the domain name industry uh, after experiencing great success in that industry. I uh, put his uh, attention on spirituality. He's a long-term uh, practitioner of meditation, I should say. I've known uh, Zappi for a number of years, and he's also interested in plant medicine. Also, I would categorize as psychedelics and how they can be useful and helpful to people in their health and spiritual pursuits. And he uh, has made the documentary, The Reality of Truth. Uh, he's made it with um, the filmmaker uh, Rodriguez, uh, or the, the actress, and also uh, he has such uh, well-known spiritual leaders uh, of our time, like Deepak Chopra, Ram Dass, Marianne Williamson, Sri Sri, Ravi Shankar. Uh, so, Zappi, thank you so very much for taking the time to come on the show with us today. Great, great to be with you guys. I've been looking forward. Zappi, uh, let's fill our audience in a little bit more about your background. You, you were a uh, inter internet entrepreneur and somehow came to uh, the, d the domain, so to speak, of uh, spirituality. How did, tell us about that transition. Yeah, so, um, you know, in the reality of truth, my documentary it really is a biography of what happened to me. And it's sort of one of these classic stories of where I had reached what society would say is uh, success at different levels, and I reached sort of the high level of success, and I was just feeling a little bit empty. And um, so what had happened to me as an entrepreneur was I worked on Wall Street and uh, eventually became an entrepreneur, and I saw the internet happening in 1998, and I thought, wow, I should get into here. I'm a marketer. This looks really good. And I came up with a concept that I should buy uh, category generic domain name, something like cars.com or beer.com or something. And uh, so I, I went after those names. And the first one I bought in 1998 was beer.com. And uh, I window dressed up the website a little bit. And uh, a couple months later, I sold it. I had bought it for $80,000 from the person that owned it. A few months later, I sold it to Interbrew up in Toronto for $7 million. And so I was like, wow, this is a good industry. I should get back to this. I bought diamond.com from uh, a software company and wound up doing a deal and selling it for several million again to uh, a uh, diamond company. And during the internet bubble time of 2000, I actually wound up doing a Super Bowl ad for my dot com, which was computer.com and 1-800-COMPUTER, the phone number. And that was you know, an amazing experience to uh, do and star in a Super Bowl commercial at the time. And, um, you know, after the, the internet bubble burst in 2000, I was, you know, thinking to myself, well, everybody's running away from the internet and dot coms are dead, everybody's saying, but I seem to be using my email more than ever. I seem to be, um, you know, uh, shopping online more than ever. And so there's really, you know, potentially something to this. I should, you know, figure it out. And I wanted to get another one of those category domain names. And my spiritual teaching that I had was telling me that I should go with something that was uh, virtual, something that was non-physical, because mm -hmm. there's more opportunity when there's non-physicality in something is what I had learned. So the next category I went for was credit cards, creditcards.com. And I wound up buying it from a group. I paid them $100,000 which uh, was, you know, seemed great to me. I, I worked on it for about three years with some friends and we had a great business going. We took money out all the time. And the reason I'm telling you this story is this is like the fish that got away story, you know? So with all my successes that I'd had um, after developing creditcards.com for three years, I, uh, somebody approached us and said, hey, I'm doing really well in the uh, financial lead generation space. I would love to partner with you with creditcards.com, I could be doing even better. And my partners who hadn't had some of the early successes I had said, oh, let's just sell it to him and we'll diverse, take the money and diversify into a bunch of domain names. And so we wound up selling it to this person for 
three million dollars. So you know, uh, in the face of it, it seems pretty okay. You buy something for a hundred thousand, sell for three million a few years later after taking money out. Great. But, uh, you know, I had this nagging feeling that I, that's something, you know, I was doing kind of the wrong thing. Um, and so, uh, lo and behold, this guy, um, you know, he took the traffic and the revenues that we had and he just started putting it back into buying more search engine traffic and he started creating more leads for credit card companies. And he went back to all the banks and said, hey, I need more money per lead since I'm giving you more volume. And they said, no problem. And long story short, Two years to the to the month that I sold it to him for three million, he turned around, sold it to American Capital for one hundred and thirty three million, oh. and uh, uh-huh. it was the <laughs> same website, same business model, same logo, and so you know here I am. I still have to you know watch commercials on CNBC and MSNBC, you know, going by for CreditCards.com, and so. Yeah. You know, there was I was looking at that like, wow, that's, you know, maybe 50 million dollars that I don't have that I'm not right, going right. to get back. <laughs> Zappy, let me ask you a question here. Uh, yeah. Might there have been a great spiritual lesson for you in that, in that, hey, stay in the moment, stay in the present. Uh, I, I made a lot of money on this thing. It's great. Not what I missed, but what I got. And, and I'm sure that would not be an e- easy, easy spiritual pill <laughs> to swallow. But was there some of that? as well for you that you, you 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 had to go inside and really deal with that in yourself yeah no i really did i had to because uh you know i knew even though i was staying proactive and i you know bought a few more and i continued to do well it's still it was in my consciousness and i think i might have even been carrying that forward in sort of a negative something negative in me that i was putting out there towards people and just you know anger you know and it wasn't until a long time later, it wasn't until, you know, really around the time that I real that I knew that the movie, the reality of truth was going to be finished and that it was really going to be impactful to people that I said, you know what? I go, I just got it. I said, the universe, you know, needed me to go through that experience because if I hadn't gone through that, if I hadn't, if that hadn't happened to me, I might be sitting on a boat in, you know, Bimini or something, uh-huh. just thinking about myself or whatever. <laughs> but, you know, this movie, it's so important to have put together that I don't think I would have done it unless I had gotten myself all the way into a corner. And uh, so I, for me, that was really, I, I chalked it up to, hey, that had to happen for me to, you know, create the reality of truth and, and take it to the extent that I did. It was mm-hmm. the only thing that I really, you know, it was the only way I could truly rationalize why, because I wouldn't have done it if that hadn't happened in part. There were probably a lot of other things that happened because you had that uh, setback. Is that, is that also true? Did, yeah. how, was it a spur and not only to the movie, but to your own spiritual <clears throat> development? Um, yeah, you know, I, I'd been on a spiritual path a little bit earlier. Somebody had taught me, uh, in the, uh, uh, in the mid 2000, around 2005, um, you know, I started to, you know, have had a lot of trappings of success and things like that. I just kept thinking, you know, this is like, I just, I want to find, um, actually I I should say it's probably closer to 2000 when this happened, but that I started to, you know, just look deeper because some of the things, some of the milestones of making money or, you know, being a vice president, like I was on wall street and these things, it just, they were hollow to me. So I, I was on a date, I was looking for spirituality, something that I always, you know, felt like I had somewhere within me. And, um, those, these things push you a little bit, you know, further and deeper. And Mm -hmm. so somebody taught me, uh, some basic lessons of Kabbalah, in the uh around 2000 around that time they had taught me that and they had taught me a meditation practice which was a mantra based meditation practice very similar to transcendental meditation i learned years and years later but uh what happened was this meditation uh really uh when i would do it i would get really uh in touch with myself i would have find a lot of creativity in there ideas and things like that and so it, I really went on what I would call a spiritual mission where I just felt like, hey, you know what? I tried what society told me was going to make me happy and I have a you know fantastic life, 
but there, I feel like there's something still missing. And how am I going to find that? And meditation was part of it. And then, um, you know, as you know, segueing into the reality of truth, what happened was um, I had had some very positive experiences over my uh, lifetime with psychedelic plants. And I always thought they were, you know, very natural. You know, they, you, they basically I had what happened was my my psychedelic experience that changed my life was I looked at my hand during one of these experiences and I could see that it was trillions of atoms and they were just vibrating at this certain frequency. And then I could see that the table next to me was made out of the same atoms. They were just vibrating at a different frequency. And I was like, oh, my God, look at this. Everything's just frequency, you know, I, and and to be able to see things at that level. Now, when bad things happen or, you know, negative energy comes at you or whatever it is, good things, uh, you when you see things at an energy level like that, um, you can never unsee it. But you start to not take things quite so serious with your five senses because, you know, that there's this whole other reality mm -hmm. going on that's. 99% of the real picture. Right. Uh, Zabi, so, uh, yeah, let, let's talk about yeah. that. Uh, plant medicine, also known as psychedelics, and uh, obviously very controversial for 50 years. Research was sort of called off because of abuses in, in regard to people uh, using psychedelics. And, so, uh, and now just coming back into uh, sort of serious research. And, and as a matter of fact, I should mention that uh, a, a friend of mine uh, who I introduced you to and we met uh, who's funding some of the research that's going on at John Hopkins University and uh, and New York University Medical School on uh, psilocybin? Uh, you know, I, I listened to you guys uh, discuss it, and obviously, uh, uh, if if handled properly, properly, uh, plant medicine or psychedelics can be very significant in the treatment of mental health and other issues. Uh, tell us about that, and what do you what do you see in the future? And what are your, some of your goals of, in regard to uh, that happening? Yeah, no, that's a really important issue. I think, you know, to me, uh, the, the situation is such that I wish everybody could just meditate and go inside and, and have that transcendental experience. But with society right now coming at you and the media and institutions coming at you uh, so hard and so, you know, constant, it's really hard to get somebody to get into that present moment awareness, to get into the now. And so I believe that these plants that are growing out of the ground that once again are just atoms vibrating at a certain frequency, that when you put these frequencies into your frequency and then you synthesize them, that something happens there. Even, you know, you use an essential oil or something, you put it on your skin, you're synthesizing those that frequency with yours. And so I always, from that psychedelic experience that I had, said, hey, this is really positive. This was positive. But I got to go now and figure out if, if I were to try to have a spiritual experience, a really deep one, could I use these plants that, um, and if I use them, could I, could I do it with the intent of expanding my consciousness as opposed to when I was younger, when I might have done it just to, you know, have a good time or see what would happen, kind of like, a, you know, you do in your youth. If I was going to do these things with the right intent and, you know, to expand my consciousness, it didn't seem like it could go bad. It seemed very natural. And so the reality of truth documentary is really about me actress Michelle Rodriguez from Fast and Furious movies and um, our friends. And what we decided was we wanted to try to have a spiritual experience uh, because really that's the breakthrough. That's what you have to have in order to change your life is an actual spiritual experience, in my opinion. And so we said, let's try meditation techniques, breathing techniques. Let's try plant medicine and see if we could actually have a spiritual experience and then if so could this be something that you know society could use and mass to solve some of the big problems we have and so what we did is we um we went uh basically it, it really started as you'll see in the movie with deepak chopra and i had done a project about kabbalah with deepak chopra um in, uh, in the early 2000s um and 
we put together something called um, uh, Ask the Kabbalah, a guidebook about how the Kabbalah and the Vedic wisdom are kind of overlapped very clearly. And um, so I got friendly with Deepak and, and I'd known him for a number of years. And what happened was, and this is the story in the in the film, but I was reading the Bible and I was just rereading all these different things. And I came to the part in the Bible where it talks about the manna from heaven, the food that front that God gave the Israelites when they were wandering in the desert. And I always I was thinking about the story and I was like, I don't know, it just seems weird that like croissants would fall out of the sky and they gathered them up and ate them. It doesn't really make that much sense to me. But like let me let me look at this a little bit more. And as I started to look at it and I started to read the descriptions of what the mana was, and I read these and it said it's a small round thing that appears in the morning dew. Uh, if you leave it overnight in your bag or your tent or whatnot, worms will come out of it and it'll stink. And it said um, you could take the mana and you could dry it out in the sun and it won't rot and have worms and you could eat it later, you know, dehydrate it. And I was like, wow, you know, dehydrated worms, small round thing. Morning. I was like, this sounds a lot more like a mushroom than it does some <laughs> bread. And and I was like, you know, a mushroom, that's a whole food. You can survive on that. And maybe some of the mana that they were consuming from, you know, around their herds and things like that, that they were wandering with, maybe some of those were psychedelic mushrooms that were potentially tuning them in into this spiritual experience. Right. And so uh, just to go further on that, I just, you know, I, it hit me and I was like, oh, my God. Like one night I was like, I got to call Deepak Chopra. I got to call him. I go, I know he may say, I'm hoping he says, no, Zappy, that's ridiculous. I heard this 20 years ago, and here's why it's not, and here's what it is, and blah, blah, blah. I also thought, oh, this is scary, because after I make this phone call, he may never take my call again, because I'm <laughs> basically saying there's psychedelics in the Bible at the root of, you know, uh, spirituality, potentially. So I call up Deepak, and I, I was like, look, I just found this in the Bible, blah, blah, blah. And I said, what do you think? And I was waiting for him to tell me why it was, wasn't and everything. And he was silent on the phone. And I was like, Deepak? And he's like, yeah, yeah. Where, where'd you find this? And I was like, oh, he said, send me the stuff. And I was like, all right, I will. He said, the reason this is resonating with me is because in my uh, Vedic tradition, in the, um, in the Rig Veda, the, the, there's something called soma, a plant, a mystery plant that was mentioned over a hundred times in the Rig Veda. And he said, when you read the that Rig Veda scientifically, it says that the soma was a plant that doesn't come from a seed. And he said, the only plant that doesn't come from a seed is a mushroom. It's spores. And mm -hmm. he said, so my me and, and some people like me have always thought that, hey, obviously this is mushrooms they don't call it mushrooms but you know they it, it can't be anything else okay it talks about in the Rig Veda how the uh, holy men would drink the urine of the reindeer the stag to get the soma and that's a classic shamanistic uh, approach to um, you know the reindeer eat the mushrooms and then the the shaman will capture the urine and actually drink it uh, a number of times and get that uh, that effect. So I, he was like, obviously it's, you know, here it is showing up in a couple different religious places. So I was like, okay, well, what do we do? This is like, should we write a book or what? He said, no, this is too important. He said, let's shoot a video with you and me talking about it. And, uh, let's, you know, capture this. So I was like, oh, mm -hmm. okay, that sounds cool. So I got my crew together. A really, um, got a family member was, uh, uh, a videographer, photographer I'd worked with for a long time. I went and I shot this interview with Deepak. And Deepak said to me, at the, as, as you'll see in the movie, he says, you know, I said, so what are we going to do? How do we get people to break through if we're, you know, if this is really true, that potentially everything that people think is at the basis of spirituality or religion, maybe it isn't this, but the fact that it could be means that you really can't take anything ultra seriously or think that you have the absolute 100% truth to what you're saying. So Deepak said, uh, he said, I don't know, maybe you got to go down to Peru and, you know, put it in the pot, stir it up and drink it. 
And I was like, wow, that's, that's a really now, now good Zabby, idea. Let, let me just interrupt <laughs> you for one second. In all this, and I'd like Phil to come in on this as well, uh, were, were, at, at any point did you address the inherent dangers? Because there are a lot of people that uh, have had bad experiences with psychedelics over the years, maybe improperly used, maybe wrong dosages, whatever. But that was what caused all the research to stop for many years. And that there, uh, and even today, there are some, you know, walking wounded as a result yeah. of uh, yeah. trying for spiritual experiences through through uh, through uh, uh, these uh, medicinal plants. Yeah, that's a good point. I mean, look, I I look at it like this. Um, in reality, these plants are growing out of the ground for some reason. They're manifesting themselves on this planet. And as Deepak said, you have a receptor in your brain, so obviously, you know, you are supposed to potentially interact with these different things. But, you know, when I look at danger and things like that, um, you know, that tens of thousands of people are dying from pharmaceutical drugs every year that are petroleum-based, man-made things. Mm -hmm. um, you know, more people die of, uh, you know, peanut allergy than die of, you know, marijuana or mushrooms or something like that. And I think, like, Always the most important thing, and this is the point that Deepak and I always make, is you have to be in the right set and setting, you know, with the right people, the right guidance, the right place. And then if your uh, approach is just to expand your consciousness, not to solve your problems or get the answer you need, but just to expand your consciousness, it really probably can't go wrong and it's a very natural thing. So you know, when people do say danger, I say, you know, I there's never really been any, um, you know, significant uh, danger with these psychedelics. Millions and millions of people um, have done, you know, mushrooms and, you know, acid, which, you know, pe again, there's a lot of misconceptions because I think a lot, a lot of people think that, you know, acid is a chemical or something like that. Like, I never do that. And it turns out that, you know, uh, it's actually bacteria that grows on a rye seed yeah, is yeah. what but, LSD but, uh, is. Zappy and Phil, if you could come in too, uh, there are people and uh, that, especially people that have uh, uh, histories of psychological imbalance that have gotten involved in, in psychedelics and maybe even for all the good reasons that haven't had good results. And, and I, I agree with you. You can take all the pharmaceuticals and, and, uh, and, and show thousands of cases where people have gotten sick with them and all. But, but I, I'm just saying it in the sense that uh, I think that if anybody moves in this direction or is interested, they have to really uh, be careful and make sure that they do it properly. And, and for I think sure. for certain people that are maybe not psychologically so balanced or maybe on other medications that they have to be extra careful in regard to all this. Yeah, yeah. and uh, I would add that, you know, my uh, Zappi mentioned this concept of set and setting, which has been... Uh, you know, an integral part of psychedelic research since the 60s. And, and all the advocates of it from Ram Dass on down seem to emphasize the importance of that. No one's suggesting that uh, psychedelics, you know, cause people to die, but they do, you know, they have been known to set people in the wrong direction if not handled properly. So uh, hence yeah. the set the set and setting part right. that you mentioned, I, I, I would assume that you and Deepak and others would uh, pay particular emphasis on that. Isn't that right? No question. Absolutely. And, uh, you know, I, I would put it further that I think, you know, 500 years from now, uh, society is going to look back on our culture, the turn of the century kind of, you know, culture and say, right. can you believe these people turned away from <laughs> nature and plants uh -huh. and they tried to go their pharmaceutical you know petroleum based technique and they made this they they almost you know they stopped progress and they almost you know destroyed themselves hopefully that's they're saying almost destroyed themselves but um, yep. yeah um i have a question about the film um yep. In the context of your uh, shooting interviews and uh, with people, um, some of, did you discuss psychedelics with all of them, or were you sort of homing in on their area of expertise? I'm thinking specifically of Sri Sri Ravi Shankar, 
And, uh, you know, I know him and his teachings, and I wondered uh, what he had to say about the subject, if you approached it at all. Yes, yes, I did. I I wanted to be sure that people knew that I wasn't sandbagging them somehow, and I was going to, you know, they were going to talk about meditation and wind up in a movie about psychedelics. (laughs) Right, (laughs) right. I had the same thought. Yeah. So I was very clear, and 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 to their credit, from John Hagelin in Transcendental Meditation to Sri Sri Ravi Shankar to you know Marianne Williamson and Deepak and all these people, they all were willing to you know engage because uh, you know it was really about going inside and maybe you know and again they were talking about you know generally what, why they thought their technique might be you know a piece of the puzzle. But I really respected that, um, you know, people like John Hagelin and Sri Sri and Deepak. And what I what I figured out was that was interesting. And I I had to call these people on it to some degree. Uh, it was kind of the hardest part about my interviews was I kind of had to call them and say, well, have you ever done psychedelics? And they mm-hmm. all said, yeah, I was, you know, a product of the 60s. Blah, 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 you know, I did. Blah, blah. And I said, OK, you know, and they and sometimes they would say, but you don't need it. You know, you don't need to do mm-hmm. that. You can use meditation or breathing. And I said, well, I'm not exactly sure that's true. I mean, for some people, yes. But you, Mr. Thought Leader, had your experience <laughs> mm-hmm. with uh, psychedelics and it made you a lifetime seeker. And here you are. I mean, would you be who you are right now if you hadn't <laughs> had that experience? And, uh-huh. you know, all all of them were very cool. They actually from, you know, even people that you wouldn't expect said, hey, look, you know what? I don't know. But it was an important thing. It was something yeah. I did. And, you know, I'm now integrating this uh, maybe more natural or not natural, but, you know, more uh, within myself approach of my own uh, mm-hmm. energy to do this. Right. So. It was really cool. I, I really, again, you know, the fact that, you know, Deepak Chopra has, um, you know, maybe has had a falling out with the Transcendental Meditation movement. I felt I really respected John Hagelin and the movement for letting me talk to them. I know mm-hmm. that they've had their, you know, bouts with, you know, Sri Sri Ravi Shankar, but they still, he was willing to be in it. And so everybody just kind of fell in really nicely. And, um, and I think one of the things that was important was, um, you know, they could tell that we were passionate, but we had a lot of respect. Like we weren't trying to say this is the way it is, you know, mm-hmm. and, yeah. you know, it was really it was like an like a do- we were documenting what happened as opposed to trying to, you know, fully have an agenda of uh, whatever we wanted. And right. so one of the most powerful parts of the movie for me is that we actually went down to Peru because after my interview with Deepak, Deepak, I said, so what do I do? What, what should I make out of this? And he said, well, you know, Zappy, he's like, you're going to have to take people on the journey on that romantic experience of going and having the direct experience yourself. Because, you know, like Maharishi said, you can talk about a strawberry all day, but you got to, you know, have the direct experience, eat the strawberry, and then let's talk about it. It'll be a different conversation. So, I was like, you know what? I've heard about this ayahuasca. It's a vine that grows. It's a vine, a vine and a leaf that they brew a tea out of in the rainforest. They've been using it for millennia. Now with modern science and air travel and everything, it's possible for Western people to go down there and have this uh, brew and drink it, which is like a six or seven hour psychedelic experience. And I, I had been told that there was some spiritual aspect to it. And that um, I said to myself, well, I got to go do that. You know, I'm going to go get my friends and I'm going to film this and let's have the direct experience. I I think if my intent is to expand my consciousness, it's probably going to go like Deepak said, it's going to go okay. And I'll be in the right set and setting with the shaman and all that. So I I took my crew down there and we sat with a shaman. We did two medicines. We drank some San Pedro, which is a cactus. At, a, at the top of a 17,000 foot mountain. And then we hike down while having this, uh, our filters taken off by the San Pedro. And then a couple days later, we, we sat in, in the jungle, in the rainforest, in an enclosed uh, space. And we drank the ayahuasca brew and had that experience. And in the movie, you see Michelle Rodriguez's transformation in the movie. And it's really palatable. You see her, she comes to Peru 
and she's really cool, but she's kind of got an edge to her. And you're like, oh, she's cool, but she's, she's kind of edgy, you know? And then you see her do the San Pedro, and you see her describe how 20 years of heavy pain and therapy that she's not going to have to do anymore because of that experience. If she And if she never even did the ayahuasca, she's had a life-changing experience. And then you see her we do the ayahuasca and you see her after the ayahuasca and she's just a completely different energy. But at the same time, you can see that she's still herself. And I think that's one of the major fears mm-hmm. that people have is, Oh God, what if I go off the rails or what if, you know, it tells me I should be a yoga instructor. Oh God. But <laughs> you could see that she was a, a, a transformed energy but she was still herself. Wow. And then what I did is, yeah, I, I wound up following her for a couple of years. We would get together and we had a few more psychedelic experiences together. And um, I would follow her and we'd do an interview about what was going on in our life and how we integrated it or how it was helping us or not. And you could see in that transformation what was really cool is, you know, I, I, I kept on getting her maybe like a week or two after the Fast and Furious movies would come out. And what I really respected about her was, you know, the movie was, you know, doing five hundred million dollars, you know, two weeks and a billion dollars. And, you know, all this media is coming. And, you know, she could have been like like anybody, you know, caught in the ego of it and just running around and partying and enjoying the, you know. But instead, she was taking the time to step back and be with her friends and, you know, talk about spirituality and analyze where she was at and I was like wow you know here's this you know that's really incredible and so to get her insight and to see how you know she had a cast member on Fast and Furious die uh, in a car accident Mm -hmm. Um, and and she talked about how her experience with the ayahuasca you know uh, affected how she perceived that in her life and she also talked about you know how um you know, fame and all this crazy stuff that comes at you, what she's been able to, you know, handle it in her own way because of some of these different experiences that she had. And it was, it's really, it's really powerful. She's probably one of the best advocates for plant medicine and transcending that there is um, in the world. For those, for those, I wanted to say, for those listening in, the, the website is therealityoftruth.com and you can find out about the film, uh, watch a trailer and actually how to how to get the film, uh, Phil? We should wrap it up. Any final uh, thoughts yeah, or I questions? To, yeah, yeah. Let's ask Zappy. Um, in the course of making this film, you traveled a lot. You spoke to a lot of people. Did anything in particular surprise you? What did you come away with uh, mm-hmm. as a, the sort of most salient and lasting uh, lesson from the experience? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, you know. It kind of, it came, it's come after the movie, really, Phil, is what happened is that, you know, people can see the movie right now for free on YouTube. They can just go to YouTube and put in the reality of truth. And the movie has actually been seen over a million times just on YouTube in the last 12 weeks. So it's really got this momentum and it's starting to really accelerate. And what what hit me really hard was that uh, I did a screening in Venice, California, the movie, and I did a Q&A after. And uh, a couple hundred people came. And after the movie, there was, you know, several people came up to me after to talk. And one of the people was a 65-year-old Asian woman. And she said, I think this movie just saved my life. And I was like, oh, oh cool. Okay, that's great. And she said, no, I mean it. She said, I have had childhood PTSD and I was preparing to kill myself because nothing was uh, working for me. And she said, I had no idea culturally that these plants even existed. I have no way. I never knew this. And she hopped on a plane, went down to Costa Rica, which is part of the film. What occurred during the film is that one of the participants uh, who was around the film wound up opening up a plant medicine, legal plant medicine center, an amazing set and setting place in Costa Rica called Rhythmia. And uh, she uh, she went down there. She had the plant medicine experience. And here it is, you know, several months later, she's 
uh, I'm doing amazing. She's just full of joy and bliss. And she's just like, I never knew I could break through that. And I thank you. And so when I hear those experiences, I hear them a lot. You know, I get those uh, that feedback. And it's like when you, you know, really impact and save somebody's life because this information is not out. That's really important to me. And so I want to I want to just cut to what I what I'm doing now is I've started something with a friend of mine. It's called the Mind Army. And you can go to mindarmy.org and, and check out the, the seed level beginnings of this. But what the Mind Army is, is we are demanding the right to go inside our own minds for answers and healing. Because when they made these uh, psychedelics illegal in the 1960s, they said, we don't know, you know if they're dangerous or what to do. These have to be studied. And so for 50 years, these plants and things have been illegal to use or even to research. And so now we know 50 years later that uh, there's healing, both physical and spiritual healing that's possible. They have to be studied, but the fact that we're not doing that, that's why I say 500 years from now, it's gonna be looked back and people are gonna say, this society was so cruel that they actually took these medicines away from people and disrupted the, the natural flow of nature. And so I think it's just, uh, you know, this mind army, we're going to get try to get, you know, millions of people to join the mind army and just, again, demand this right, because this is a human right. What, what's, you know? the, what's the website for that? Because I'm looking at it's Yeah, it's mindarmy.org. And there's probably just a logo there right now. But the thought is that I, c um, I can sell you the domain name. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I was going to say, if there's too, one person that knows how to get a good deal on the, main, on, on the domain name, it's you, Zappi. Yeah. So great, yeah. great work. Great, great work. Uh, very interesting. We have to have you back on uh, to, uh, to discuss this more because uh, it sounds like you have a lot on your plate, a lot going forward. And again, uh, the, the film, The Reality of Truth, uh, which you can uh, uh, get online. And uh, like you said, it's on YouTube now. See that, discuss it. Uh, and I think it's amazing how you brought all of these uh, people on the uh, contemporary spiritual scene into it uh, to discuss these things. And I also admire your, your openness and honesty in dealing with this, which is a fairly controversial issue, even amongst uh, spiritual folks, uh, even new age spiritual folks these days. So uh, uh, we want to follow your work and, and uh, make sure we keep uh, our listeners up to date on it. That sounds great. I really appreciate you guys having me on and, and, and ditto to you. Thanks for being as open to be, uh, you know, talking about, you know, all realms of spirituality and just, you know, figuring out what's good for each person. So thank you. Okay. okay. All the best, Zappy. Thank you. You too. Bye-bye. Yeah.